The editing process uncovered Joseph's anomalous assumptions about the nature of revealed words. He never considered the wording infallible. God's language stood in an indefinite relationship to the human language coming through the prophet. The revealed preface to the Book of Commandments specified that the language of the revelations was Joseph Smith's. These commandments are of me, and were given unto my servants in their weakness after the manner of their language, that they might come to understanding. They were couched in language suitable to Joseph's time, the idioms, the grammar, even the tone had to be comprehensible to 1830s America. Recognizing the pliability of the revealed words, Joseph freely edited the revelations by the Holy Spirit, making emendations with each new edition. He thought of his revelations as imprinted on his mind, not graven in stone. With each edition, he patched pieces together and altered the wording to clarify meaning. The words were both his and God's. Richard Bushman This is A Word Fitly Spoken. Willie Grills, Zelwyn Heidi here to talk about more Joseph Smith. Zelwyn, how are you? I'm doing pretty good. I've been out and about all day today and trying to get some things done, which of course in my part of the world means driving tremendous distances, but that's just, <laughs> that's neither here nor there. Pulling the hand cart out and just making it. <laughs> getting, getting the horse and going, you know, stuff like that. <laughs> But otherwise, I mean, I'm I'm looking forward to getting back into this. I know it's been a little while since we've been since we've talked about Joseph Smith. But uh, what about you, Willie? How are things going for you? Oh, so far so good. Can't complain. The mild winter continues, although we uh, apparently do have a little bit of snow and ice coming. But part of it, nothing major, nothing we can't handle. <laughs> nothing unusual, right? So here we are, Joseph Smith Part Two. We promise we're going to try to finish the saga of Joseph Smith in this episode. I think we can do it. Yeah, not not the saga of Mormonism in entirety, because that's still got some more episodes, but Joseph Smith himself. Right. So we basically follow Joseph Smith's early life through the quote-unquote translation of the Book of Mormon, through the production of the Book of Mormon, and then we got into the period in Kirtland, Ohio. And we're going to have to backtrack a little bit and talk about Kirtland in more detail this episode because it is so significant. And there are three big eras that we're going to talk about. Joseph in Kirtland, Ohio, in Missouri, and then finally in Nauvoo, Illinois. We're going to see a picture of Mormonism that we might not be familiar with. We're going to see a picture of the United States government that we might not be familiar with as well. It's a very interesting history, and one that even if you're not interested in Mormon theology per se, you might be interested in American history and just how things worked back then and maybe some precedents that were set early and then kind of exaggerated post-Civil War. So I think that's going to be interesting to unpack. Zelwyn, any comments before we dig into Kirtland here? Coming from my background where, you know, I, Willie is kind of the one who's really gotten me into studying Joseph Smith and really digging into this history. And I can say, at least for myself, that the events that we're going to be unpacking today in particular, even if you're not particularly inclined to be sympathetic to Mormonism, it's going to be very interesting because, I mean, it is it is so heart-tugging, at least in Missouri, about what happens to these people and also the things that they had to struggle with. So even if you can say, yes, we can't agree with their theology, at least we can still sympathize with them as human beings. So with that in mind then, Willie, you said we needed to backtrack into Ohio a little bit. Where do you want to start in that story? Well, we're going to start in basically 1831. So Joseph Smith is 26 or so. He moves his family to Kirtland, Ohio. And that's going to be significant. There, they're founding the first real Mormon community, and there the first temple is built. So he receives this revelation telling the saints to gather in Ohio. Odd place, but that's it's where he believed that they should gather. And that's where the first temple is built. Now, the temple is not going to be dedicated until 1836, so we're, we're kind of jumping around a little bit. Temples are... Sacred spaces for Mormons, that was laid down early. 
That's where the sacred ordinances take place in the Mormon church. At this time, it would not have been uncommon for them not to have regular meeting houses. In fact, they just didn't have them. And so regular Sunday worship, you know, depending on where they were, might not have been a, a thing. But this temple is a little bit different. It doesn't look like a modern temple in the LDS church, for example. It's kind of a multi-purpose structure. It's interesting. So today, as Gentiles like we are, we would not be permitted inside of an LDS temple. Right. And much of what they do in there is kept secret, although it has leaked. It's kind of like masonry. These rituals are, in theory, secret, but defectors have, have leaked them. And and so you have sacred washings going on, the, things called endowments, which are like liturgical ceremonies that they do. There are sealings, which they believe seal families together, husbands and wives and children all together for time and eternity. As those things have developed, the temple liturgies have developed. Well, at this time, it's very rudimentary what's going on. We won't see a lot of these more Masonic-looking ceremonies going on in the temple until Nauvoo. But here, the Kirtland Temple is being built, and that's a very significant thing for the early Latter-day Saint movement. We talked a little bit about this in the first episode, but this building's built, and it is by all accounts beautiful. It's rather expensive. It it shone. It like shined in the sun because of the paint used and everything. It's kind of brilliant in its own way. And there are dozens of documented instances of people seeing things like angels flying in and out of the windows or people seeing God talk to Joseph Smith and that kind of, that kind of thing. Things we should look at skeptically. Right. And, you know, you wonder what's going on here. Is everybody just making it up? Could be. Is it mass hallucination? Could be. You know, is it demonic apparitions? Could be. I mean, it's something kind of like the visions at Fatima, right? I think that's something on a Lutheran podcast we can safely say that we don't affirm the visions at Fatima <laughs> in Portugal. I mean, Zellan, you might disagree, but... No, I'm, I'm, I'm tracking. Don't worry. Don't worry. <laughs> I was just going to ask you, though, Willie, uh, maybe for the sake of our listeners today, does, does the Kirtland Temple still stand? The Kirtland Temple still stands. The original building's there. It is not owned by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. That's the largest Latter-day Saint denomination. It's right. owned by the reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, now known as the Community of Christ. So it's owned by the most significant Mormon, you know, other Mormon denomination, I guess we'd say. Right, right, right. And so it is open to the public, though. Their temples are open to the public. Oh, they are? Okay. Yeah. So the Kirtland Temple's open, and then I believe they have one in Independence, Missouri, that's open on the temple okay. lot there. And we'll we'll get to the whole division about that whole succession crisis, but I just thought that would be it is interesting though that the gentiles as it were can actually go into these to the Kirtland Temple and see what it looked like. I I didn't know that. So, and I do think that it's there's been some shifts in the ownership over the years, but for the longest time it's belonged to the to the RLDS church. As far as I know, still open to the public for tours, everything like that, and even for prayer like the one in in Missouri. I do get some of these splinter groups a little confused sometimes. So, you know, if I make that mistake, I doubt anybody's going to check us, but it could happen. It could happen. The temple being built is significant because it shows that they're looking for a permanent settlement. Now, I don't know that Joseph always intends for it to be in Ohio, but they are building communities with permanent structures. They're not wandering in the wilderness just yet. Well, that's going to come. The other significant thing about Kirtland is Sidney Rigdon, and he's going to feature majorly into the story here. Again, we've mentioned him on probably two or three podcasts now. He is an associate of Alexander Campbell, a follower of Alexander Campbell, who you know as the founder of the Campbellites, otherwise known as the Christian Church, Churches of Christ, or Disciples of Christ. Somebody we've also mentioned in about half a dozen podcasts. But... <laughs> exactly. You know, very influential on in American Christianity. And we talked about these restorationists in the, in this first episode, but Campbell is the primitivist type of restorationist, whereas Smith is a visionary. And right. so for Campbell, it's all about stripping everything away to go back to a basic biblical Christianity in theory. And for Joseph, it's about new revelations, new visions, new things. And so here's Rigdon, who's followed Campbell, but he comes under the spell of 
Joseph Smith. What do you think attracted Rigdon to Smith? I mean, obviously, if you're kind of associated with Campbell and, and one strain of restorationism, and now you kind of go, go over to the complete opposite side, what is it that actually brought him there? Well, I think it is, one, that attempt to go back to original Christianity. Okay. So, so both Joseph Smith and Alexander Campbell are claiming to have restored the New Testament church just in two very different ways. Right. Rigdon has some Baptist background. I believe he was even licensed to preach by the regular Baptists, and the f- official name, by the way, regular Baptist. That gets confusing because Campbell is early on, they're known as Christian Baptists, and it all gets confusing. But <laughs> at a certain point, his congregations or members of his congregation come into contact with the Book of Mormon. Rigdon reads the Book of Mormon and believes it and then is baptized into what is then called the Church of Christ, but that that's what Joseph Smith originally named the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. It was the Church right. of Christ. So he reads the Book of Mormon, and a number of his followers and leaders in his churches go with him to Joseph Smith. Now, Rigdon is highly influential. He rises up the ranks very fast. He brings a lot more people in. I mean, he brings as many people into the movement early on as Smith does. So you could, I mean, you could almost call it like the Smith-Rigdon movement early on. Sure. He has a skill that Joseph Smith does not in that he is a very fiery orator. He's a, he's a very persuasive preacher. Preaching falsehood, yeah, but he's good at it. That can't be discounted. He's an irascible person. He's a bit unstable in many of his ways, but he is the great preacher of the early Latter-day Saint movement, which is something that they desperately needed because Smith didn't have that. It's it's amazing. Like Smith seems to just be a charmer. And I mean that in a, in a positive way as I can put it, because he's not a good administrator and he's right. not a great preacher. Although he does all these things or attempts to do all of these things, those aren't really where his strengths lie. Rigdon's the better preacher. And then as we'll see in a later episode, Brigham Young is the great administrator. And Joseph is just frankly, neither of those things. <laughs> you have Sidney Rigdon. Rigdon and Smith were close. They they claimed to receive the same visions. They would stare out of a window, and Joseph Smith would describe a scene like, I, you know, for instance, like, I see two angels standing on a hill, and Rigdon would go, yes, I see the same thing. And then Rigdon would be like, I see, you know, four angels over there. And Joseph would go, yes, I see the same thing. <laughs> I mean, it's just a thing they had, which— one over their audience, but you know, I think we would kind of laugh at the, I mean, really the absurdity of that kind of situation. But, <laughs> but this was common. I mean, these visions are coming in and and all that. So while all this is going on, they're getting things settled. There are settlers heading to Missouri. They are eventually expelled without any any cause, any real cause, other than they were accused of possibly inciting insurrection or upsetting the peace, whatever. But I'm going through this one quick because we're going to spend more time on Missouri in a minute. But this middle period here. So they're they're in Missouri. They're kicked off. Basically, their land's taken from them. So Joseph Smith goes out to Missouri to try to mediate this. He's unsuccessful. Comes back to Ohio, and then things do not go well from there. And so what happens is this is at a time where the real estate industry in the United States is booming. Kirtland's seeing that prosperity. And so they set up a bank in Kirtland. Okay, so the Kirtland Relief Society. I'm sorry, the Kirtland Safety Society. That bank, a lot of people are investing in it. It's going well, and then a giant crash hits the market in the United States. The bank goes under, and there's a lot of questions about this bank. Was it legitimate? Was it was issuing currency? Could it even do that? Right. You know, that, that sort of thing. And so the bank collapses, the economy of the town collapses. Joseph has basically no followers left in Kirtland after that. It is significant that as a result of all of this with the bank collapsing and all of these things happening in Ohio, Joseph basically loses all of his followers in Ohio. Uh, they They all leave him. And so that by the time he ends up going back to Missouri to join up with the other group, he's basically doing it alone or almost alone. Yeah. I mean, you get I mean, Brigham Young's still there, but he and Rigdon are going to part ways soon. 
possibly over polygamy, as we'll see in a little bit. Rigdon does not follow Young after Joseph Smith's death, for example. You know, a lot of the prominent people fall away, but this is losing a great number of people. So the great prophet of Mormonism is now forced to, in the dead of night, essentially get out of town. I mean, they try to take the temple by force with guns and swords. It's not a peaceful time for him. His ex-followers did or the people of the town did? His ex-followers. Okay. Okay. Yeah. The only reason I ask is because you kind of alluded to it, and we'll talk about this more in Missouri, but Mormonism as a movement is starting to see significant opposition from non-Mormons. Yeah, and it already did in the town. There, There is some of that, but th- their numbers were just so great that y- you couldn't really do anything. Right. And they're always facing opposition, but it's only going to get worse, especially as they go to Missouri. Right. You know, it, it's actually at this time that It's at the same time. So he moves to Colonel 1831, 1832. Joseph is actually tarred and feathered by townsfolk. It's not a good, it's not good when that happens. It's always played for (laughs) comedy in TV, but being tarred and feathered is pretty brutal. Right, right. So now we're heading back into Missouri and they're not really welcome there, but they haven't been expelled yet. Right. But this is 1837. He leaves 1838 is when we're going to get the so-called Mormon Wars. And we'll talk about that in a little bit because we're coming up on a break. As a matter of fact, we're going to go ahead and take that. We'll be right back with more Word Fitly Spoken. The word of the Lord says, Get wisdom, get understanding, forget it not, neither decline from the words of my mouth. You can check out all of the Word Fitly Spoken podcasts on Podbean, iTunes, or your favorite podcast app. We'll be right back. And we are back. You are listening to A Word Fitly Spoken. Willie Grills, Zolan Heidi talking Joseph Smith. So Joseph has basically been chased out of Ohio, and now he's making his way to far west Missouri. Missouri is essentially Zion for these people. They do believe that Missouri is the promised land. Missouri, I believe, is also the Garden of Eden for them. So Missouri is very significant. Smith claims to have had a number of visions having to do with Missouri and the end of the world. And so, you know, time will tell if that prediction was accurate or not. You know, as LCMS Lutherans, we might have a special interest in Missouri as well. But anyway, sorry. (laughs) That's right. (laughs) But they're in in far west, not quite on the river yet. (laughs) So anyway, they've come to Missouri, and Missouri is already not friendly towards Mormons, but it's only going to get worse. So the church is already schismed. So now you've got agitated Mormons kind of all around, and you have dissenters. And so that's going to lead to a sermon by Sidney Rigdon preached in far west Missouri called the Salt Sermon. And in the Salt Sermon, Sidney Rigdon calls for the purging of dissenters. So this is all tied up with land. So basically... The Mormons are being scammed out of their land by defected Mormons. So ex-Mormons are causing trouble. The government's getting involved with this because they're siding against the Mormons and siding with the dissenters. And so Sidney Rigdon preaches a sermon where it sounds like he calls for violence against these dissenters, that they should be trodden underfoot like salt that's thrown out. Now, Hmm. Joseph Smith gives the nod to this. And it is taken as a call to war. Rigdon, I mean, does make 
some statements like the mob that comes on to us to disturb us, it shall be between us and them a war of extermination for we will follow them until the last drop of their blood is spilled or else they will have to exterminate us for we will carry out the seat of war to their own houses, their own families, one party or another, and all shall be utterly destroyed. So basically Rigdon's making the claim that they're being persecuted and forced from their land, forced from their homes, mostly because of dissension from within. But now the government's being involved with it, right? And so he he makes this very, what to me seems clear, sermon. Now, the question is, is he advocating actually going out and committing violence, or is he talking about defending themselves against their persecutors or the people who would try to take from them? Well, now, wasn't this about the time, though, that they start forming militias? Yes. And that, uh, you mean the Mormons? The Mormons, yeah. Yeah, yeah, the Mormons are, yeah, they're already forming militias. But that's not entirely unique for large communities to have a militia at this time. Okay. And indeed, any respectable established city would have its own militia, as we'll see in Nauvoo, officially state-sanctioned one, no less. But yeah, so they... They have arms to defend themselves. They're making speeches like this. And so the governor, the governor who already has strong feelings about the Latter-day Saints, strong negative feelings, word of this gets to him. And that basically leads to what's called the Mormon Extermination Order of 1838. Mm-hmm. I think it's officially like Executive Action 44 or something like that. Now, keep in mind... This is how we need to to frame this discussion. This is a governor of a state in the Union issuing an order of extermination against a religious group. That should give us pause. Tremendous pause. Yeah. (laughs) It's not going to go well. I mean, there, there are skirmishes that precede a little bit of this, too. Tensions are just built. There's the Battle of Crooked River, which is basically Mormons you know, versus some vigilantes, that kind of thing. There there are conflicts in the villages and in the towns. We don't want to we don't want to say there are it. The question is who's provoking? Are the Mormons provoking this through their rhetoric? Are the vigilantes provoking it, like through their actual actions? That sort of thing. Now let me let me ask this question, because I seem to remember this from my reading, but maybe I'm mistaken. We talked a little bit in the last episode about Joseph Smith and his approach towards the the slavery question. Mm-hmm. And Missouri at this time was considered... Well, there's a slave state. They are a slave state, but wasn't it at least a little bit under debate or something like that? I can't remember. You know, I'm not entirely sure. I'll have to look that one up. It, it could be. Well, okay, so what happens is Joseph is very anti-slavery when he's still in Yankeedom. When he gets to Missouri, he softens a little bit. Okay. And then when he gets to Illinois, he's an abolitionist again. Okay. But the the only reason I bring that up is because his views on the question were part of what was causing some of the agitation in Missouri, right? Right. But it's the anti-slavery sentiment. Okay. That's it's driving the agitation. Okay. I just yeah. wanted to clarify um, yeah, that. To my knowledge, he never got into any kind of trouble over... You know, over advocating for slavery. I mean, you got okay. most of the Mormon immigrants coming to Missouri came from areas which were sympathetic to abolitionism. I mean, you can't okay. say that they're rabid abolitionists because that's kind of a different animal there. Right, right. So with the, the issue of abolition and on top of the fact that the Mormons have all kinds of land and also these internal divisions that are going on, you can kind of see the, the kettle boiling. Yeah, so let me give four points here. And I'm glad you mentioned the slavery thing because it kind of helped the light bulb go off there. So yeah, <laughs> so the the abolitionism by many of the followers. There was a revelation recorded in 1831, which said that if the Mormons were righteous, they would inherit land held by others, meaning Missouri, essentially. Right, right. Their economic power was found in their numbers, and so they moved into a town, all of a sudden, or a region, they could dominate the local economy. Right. And then lastly, they did extensive evangelization among the Lamanites, or as we know them, the Native Americans, or the Indians, the American Indians, which also caused some tension among the Missourians. And by that, I mean actual 
residents of the state of Missouri, not Lutheran denomination. <laughs> and, and so, right, right. We got for this for our audience. We got to make that clear. We got to clarify something. Yeah, yeah. So, so all of those things are really making the kettle boil. And so these tensions lead to harassment and violence. I mean, as early as 1833, you have them being driven out of Jackson County. And and so these sentiments grow, and it's kind of like the telephone game, right? So these tensions are there, and then the accusations against the Mormons become more and more severe until it's just almost a civil war. And this is in no way to defend the action of the Missouri governor by any means. This is just trying to put it within its historical context. Yeah. And so all these things eventually lead to executive order 44 or the extermination order. So governor Lilburn Boggs, I believe was who the governor was. Palpatine. Anyway. (laughs) Hey, the empire did nothing wrong. uh, (laughs) So he's trying to stop the economic and electoral power of the Mormons. And this is going to have disastrous consequences. So you know, best construction on it, he's trying to drive the Mormons from his from the territory, but it does lead to actual bloodshed. Uh, right. Most significantly, the the Hans Mill massacre. And maybe for the sake of our listeners, just to give a, a little bit of a flavor of the Hans Mill massacre, because I think it really emphasizes the the persecution that the the Mormons went through. Let me read just a, a short paragraph from Brody on on that night. Brody writes, That night, a wounded man stumbled into far west with news that froze the blood of every saint, every saint being every Mormon. The settlement at Hans Mill had been attacked by 200 militiamen. The Mormons had fled into the blacksmith shop, which they thought would make an admirable fort, but it had proved instead to be a slaughterhouse. Great cracks yawned between the logs of the shop, and the Missourians, hiding behind trees, picked off the Mormons at their leisure as if they had been killing cattle in a pen. When the women fled toward the brush, the men shot at them in derision. Old Thomas McBride fell wounded and surrendered his gun, whereupon one of the mob coolly hacked him to pieces with a corn cutter. And Brody goes on to describe also some more of these atrocities that were happening at Hans Mill, including the slaughter of, of children as well. So this is not something like this, the men were cut down in, in a pitched battle. This was the, the militiamen of Missouri coming and basically slaughtering women and children and old men. Huh. Government sanctioned murder of a religious sect, including women and children. Man, really gets the noggin jogging. <laughs> For another time, will we? <laughs> In a future episode. And and now would be a good time to, to discuss that. You know, what, what, where do we draw this line here? Theology has practical consequences. But laws are there for a reason. Right. And supposed freedoms are there for a reason. They hadn't really broken any laws. Their only law was being more powerful than what the governor wanted. Right. There were threats of violence, but the people who ultimately commit the greater act of violence are the state sanctioned militias. And it's really being generous calling some of them militias. A lot of them are just vigilante groups. Right. So, you know, Zellum, what do we make of this? Uh, yeah. I mean, because then you have to get into the question of religious freedom and what that means. To what extent can you tolerate? certain things happening within your territories and and how do you deal with those issues? I mean, it's a really sticky, sticky subject. Where do you want to, where do you want to start with it, Willie? (laughs) (laughs) Well, I mean, consider that this is something the Mormons have to deal with all the way up through the 1950s with the Short Creek Raid. We have to ask ourselves the question of where, you know, where do we want this line to be? Because if you push it too far, it's going to come back at you. The government can't just go in and take your property or your life away because you're weird or because you're different. Right. You know, nowadays it's always couched in in some kind of benevolent savior kind of language. Like, well, there were allegations of abuse. And yet sometimes this happens. And then after the fact, you find out the allegations weren't true. I mean, there's always some kind of noble sounding pretext that precedes the overreach. Right. I, do, I don't think that we can defend Missouri's governor. By the way, that order wasn't rescinded until like 1976. 
So it was, it was an effect for a minute. <laughs> you know, it, it's easy to go, yeah, I wouldn't want those kinds of people in my community too. And uh, certainly in 1838, we might have certainly might have thought about that. But just think of the of the consequences of those actions and think of the precedent that it sets. And the Mormons, because of these early conflicts, are going to be at the cusp of war with the United States wealth up until the late 1800s. And it's going to get a little bit even more intense in some ways when they go out to Utah. Well, and, and maybe and maybe to talk about, you know, your your question about the government and the overreach too, you know, it's, it, it's always kind of a little bit easier to step back. I'm not saying easier in some like, you know, oh, this is easy to talk about, but it's easier to step back when it's some other group and say, well, it's unfortunate that that happened to them, but whatever. But then what if that precedent is set and now suddenly the government comes after you or your group? Exactly. And the Lutherans haven't experienced that. The closest they get is not a religious thing. You know, some anti-German sentiment in world in the two world wars. Right. But that's a, that's a little bit of a different issue than what we're dealing with here. For the most part, we've been able to practice our religion freely. Right. And, and, and really, in some cases much more freely here than in the old country. It's something that's foreign to most groups. I mean, Presbyterians didn't experience th that kind of persecution in the Americas. In England, yeah. Sure. They would have. The, the Lutherans didn't. And, the you know, in, in, these, in the States, Presbyterians didn't. Baptists are largely free. I mean, the American experiment is the reason why groups like the Mormons are even allowed to exist. Right. And so now... You've got this great experiment of the freedom of religion coming up against government. And and I suppose it's one of those things where, you know, our, our values and stuff sound good on paper, and yet when we try to live them out, people don't want to. I mean, you fight the War of Independence, right? And in the first presidency, we already have the Whiskey Rebellion, for right. example. Right. So it's a case of America trying to figure out what she wants to be. And and I, I just worry that sometimes we teeter too close to some kind of totalitarianism. And I'm not advocating anarchy or anything like that, but it's a very liberty is a very precarious thing. And right. if we're going to lobby for liberty, especially freedom of religion, we have to think about what kind of consequences that would have. And then we have to have the discussion of whether or not we think there's ever a time where something like the Mormon extermination order would be appropriate. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Asking and, big questions in the middle of a historical episode. I know. Joseph Smith. Well, no, it's 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 a good question to have because I think in our in our current situation too. I mean, we're not obviously having extermination orders handed down, and I don't, you know, I don't think we're going to have it anytime soon. But at the same time, using government coercion to influence religious groups is something that we do experience. Sure. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, this is not totally foreign to our experience. Yeah, and, and with less of a threat than we have, because one of the one of the things against the Mormons is, well, they're so big right. that he's kind of like Muhammad, when he's called the American Muhammad. So it's it's like he could have a, a standing army of thousands, and we wouldn't be able to combat them. Right. The heavy hand falls on us in areas like speech right, and, and things like that. We've not quite gotten to Executive Order 44 yet. <laughs> well, if only because... In, in Joseph's day, you know, you could still have a militia and maybe actually stand up to a, a power coming against you. But yeah. when you live in our day and you have a government which has military power far beyond virtually any militia that we might be able to actually gather together, we basically have to either bow under the, the pressure of their thumb or we have to actually, you know, suffer in other ways, which is why you mentioned the speech, whatever, because we just can't reasonably fight back militarily. Does that make sense? It does. And I'm going to refrain from commenting further on that uh, to avoid any, <laughs> any uh, bl blowback. But <laughs> I mean, it, it's something we have to struggle with. This is an interesting time in American history. This is pre-Civil War. These government overreaches are only going to get worse post-Civil War and during the Civil War. Right. Which is, there's a bit of irony to that that we'll talk about a bit in Nauvoo. Let me finish up this segment with one last notable to get us toward Illinois. The extermination order is given. Hans Mill massacre happens. Joseph effectively surrenders and is arrested. Uh, fast forwarding a little bit. 
Joseph and other prominent Mormon leaders. So basically, the order is given to execute the Mormon leaders at nine o'clock. You know, basically take them to the public square of far west Missouri and kill them. And General Alexander Donovan will have none of it. He calls it cold blooded murder. Literally, that's a quote. He says, It is cold blooded murder. I will not obey your order. My brigade shall march for liberty tomorrow morning at eight o'clock. And if you execute these men, I will hold you responsible before an earthly tribunal. So help me God. So this guy, who is not a Mormon, actually saves the life of Joseph Smith. And eventually, on the way to trial, Joseph is allowed to escape. And we're not clear how he was able to escape, whether he bribed guards or or actually he made an escape. Uh, We don't know. But Donovan does save his neck. And actually, years later, Donovan will visit Salt Lake City and be uh, hailed as a hero with a giant parade and everything. So because he was so much a remembered figure in their history for that moment. Sure. But that pretty much ends the significant time in Missouri and what that does for the millennial kingdom in Missouri. You know, I, I think he's still optimistic or Joseph's still optimistic that it'll it'll happen there. Obviously, it doesn't in his lifetime. And so that's going to lead us to the subject of next segment, which is the city of Nauvoo. And that's significant for a number of reasons in uh, Mormon, Illinois, and American history. And we'll find out more about that after the break here at Word Fitly. A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold and pictures of silver. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. The Word, front and center, in doctrine, in history, in life. That's the mission of A Word Fitly Spoken. We've got more on the way. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. You are listening to A Word Fitly Spoken, Willie Grills, Zell and Heidi talking the life of Joseph Smith. So we followed him as a young boy in New England, all the way to Ohio, all the way to the skirmishes in Missouri. Now he's backtracking a little bit, heading over to Illinois, to the city that will be called Nauvoo. Now for all the persecution that the Mormons are suffering, the number of Mormons continues to grow, and Mormon settlements have always been a very important part of Mormonism. So they come to settle in a town called Commerce, Illinois, but Joseph Smith renames it to Nauvoo. Nauvoo will be significant. Nauvoo receives an official charter from the state, so it is an actual community. The Nauvoo Legion will be established, which is an official militia. So Joseph Smith does have essentially a standing army. That's where the image that some of you may have seen that we used to promo this episode, Joseph on a war horse and military gear, Yeah, that's part of the Nauvoo Legion. This community is going to be bustling, it's going to grow, and really it rivals Chicago in size at that time. Nowadays, Nauvoo is a town of about 1,100, I think. And you live fairly close to it, don't you, Willie? Yeah, just a few, few hours away. You know, I I don't go there to burn incense or anything, but it's not too far. (laughs) Not to, you know, pinpoint my exact location. No, but um, (laughs) but no, it's it's not too far. We could do it in a day trip if we wanted. But to think about a city like that rivaling Chicago gives you a little bit of an idea of the kind of influence that Mormonism has early on. It is a movement to be reckoned with. And it is a rather successful movement in terms of numbers. It's not yet successful in terms of administration. Because you see the same patterns with Joseph in Nauvoo that you saw in Kirtland, where he's the leader of this rapidly growing religious movement, but he always has a side hustle that he's trying to make work and never really can. 
So at one point he buys like a store and tries to make it work and he, he can't do that. And it's just, it's almost humorous how he fails at all these endeavors. It's almost like he can't sit still and just do that kind of work. <laughs> so, so they come into Nauvoo around 1839. And this is where really the theology of Mormonism, as we'll come to understand it, takes its shape. So, for example, baptism for the dead is first instituted in Nauvoo on the 8th of August, 1840, and that's in the Illinois River. It doesn't take place in the temple because the Nauvoo Temple had not been built yet. So they're baptizing in the Illinois River for the dead. Can you explain what that practice is for the sake of our listeners? Yes. Just uh, for clarification. Baptism for the dead is a particular Mormon belief practiced by the vast majority of Mormons, although some of the breakaway groups don't practice it. It's also known as baptism by proxy, whereby you may be baptized in place of someone else, in particular someone who's deceased. So let's say you have a deceased relative, like your grandfather, never received Mormon baptism in his earthly life. The Mormons believe that you could be baptized in the stead of that person, in the place of that person, so that... If they accept it in the afterlife, the benefits of that baptism could be applied to them. So we want to be clear here. Baptism for the dead in Mormonism is not automatically saving people. It's giving them a second chance to accept their version of the gospel in the afterlife. Does this also explain the intense Mormon interest in genealogy? It does. It very much does. And it's really a duty to seek that out. And that's significant. In Nauvoo, Joseph in particular becomes obsessed with sealing. And this is something that happens in the temple. So eventually the Nauvoo temple's built. There is a Nauvoo temple now built on the same plans, but it's not the original building. But neither here nor there. The temple is about sealing. So they're sealing families together for all eternity. And Joseph seems to come to this concept of baptism for the dead by a vision he has of his dead brother, who died and was not able to be baptized. And so from that vision comes this theology of baptism for the dead. It's a very interesting thing that's happening at this time, because you see the theology develop almost live with these revelations and everything that Joseph is coming up with, or receiving, I guess, depending on your persuasion. Right, right. The whole sealing families together, that's sealing husbands to wives, husbands to many wives, sometimes wives to different men who are not their husbands because they hadn't really developed the whole family, individual family unit being sealed thing. Yet that comes a little bit later. So you'll you'll have multiple people sealed to the prophets and apostles, for example, instead of to their actual husbands. And that happens especially in Utah. Well, because now, now, you've, now you've let the cat out of the bag here, Willie. This is something that, of course, is going to cause problems in Illinois, which we're going to get to. But talking about polygamy is something I think that we have to discuss, at least in some detail. So Yeah, well, let's go ahead and get to it. We're going to come to it a couple more times because it just it's that sticky wicket of Mormonism. And it's not until Utah is trying to become a state that they actually finally do away with the practice, at least the LDS, right? Correct. Yeah. And, you know, they just happen to receive a revelation. At the same time. Yeah. <laughs> Convenient. Yeah. So polygamy, that, that that's where it gets really interesting. Polygamy, of course, is the practice of having more than one wife. And it does appear that Joseph Smith practiced this. It's debated on how early it happens. Mm-hmm. I'm betting the 1840s. Some would say as early as 1831. I'm not quite there. Some Mormons, non-LDS, would say that Joseph never practiced polygamy, that he was always a monogamist. Which is where you're getting like your reformed group that you're talking about, the RLDS. Reorganized, yeah. Reorganized, excuse me. And they are the ones that have control of Kirtland, right? Correct. Yeah, they, they do not believe that Joseph... Well, for a long time, one of their tenets was that he didn't. And then in recent history, they've accepted that he might have. Okay. Because, of course, that comes in with the whole succession crisis, which I think will have to come into the next episode when we talk about ongoing Mormonism. But we're dealing with the question of Joseph Smith and his polygamy. I don't know. I think I think probably the... I mean, did it happen, Willie? I mean, you think that it, it, is, it is happening? I think it happened. 
Okay. I think the evidence is there that it did. You know, I could maybe be persuaded it didn't, but it certainly seems to me like something was going on. His first wife always denied that it did, and yet it seems right. that in, during his life she sanctioned some of these marriages. The question is really what constitutes a marriage, too. Well, and that and that's where, honestly, the problem that I encounter the most with Joseph Smith and his polygamy. I, I'm inclined to think that it did happen. But the thing that becomes the most difficult for like me to swallow, and I think for many people to swallow, is that this is not that he's just taking many wives, per se. It's that, like you were talking about, with the ceiling going on, sometimes he was being married somehow to other men's wives. Yeah, he, yeah, he was being married and sealed to other men's wives. And the question then means, well, was he actually acting as a husband to them? Was there a sexual relationship or not? Right. And, you know, that's that's the big debate. What, what was going on here? And we just don't know. I think right. it might have been a bit of both, quite frankly. But, yeah, the, the taking wives who are already married to other men is a very serious problem. Not that polygamy isn't, but it's one thing to have a whole bunch of wives. It's another thing to take other men's wives as your own. Right. Even if it was in just some celestial sense, you know, sealing for eternity or whatever, it's still another man's wife. And that's that's probably what I find to be the most difficult thing to deal with in this question. Right. For what it's worth, there are no children, as far as we know, produced by any of these marriages. Sure. Which is kind of an amazing thing if any kind of stuff like that was going on. Sure. And it's debated actually how many wives he has. I mean, it's it's a lot of women that he he that he's married to. Not not as much as Brigham Young's going to have later on. But the polygamy thing is significant because for early Mormons to achieve that third heaven, to achieve the celestial kingdom, you would have to practice this principle. Right. The principle of plural marriage. Especially after Joseph's death, it becomes a very important component to Mormon theology. Now, there are always accusations that Joseph is a polygamist, and in his life, he vigorously denies it in public. And he's consistently denying that he's a polygamist. Any polygamy that was going on during Joseph Smith's life was being conducted secretly. Right. It seems that he, like, here's the reason why I think he was. It seems that Sidney Rigdon parts with Joseph, mostly because Joseph was trying to marry one of his daughters. Seems to be that way. There are Mormon defectors who are going to claim that they're practicing polygamy in secret. And that's actually one of the things that leads to the death of Joseph Smith. And maybe it's a good time to get into that. But before we get to that, just before we get to that real quick, it's important to say that I think he's conducting these things in secret because as now, but especially then, polygamy is very much a stigma in American society. Yeah, and it's a crime. And it's a crime. So that for him to openly say, yeah, I'm doing it, he'd basically be saying, you know, come arrest me kind of a thing. So he has to be secretive about it. But anyway. So what you have are a number of people who turn enemy to Joseph Smith. One in particular is expelled from Nauvoo for, ironically, taking other men's wives and, <laughs> and, and adultery and things like that. So he's one of these people. There's another man more significant who goes, has a printing press and prints the only issue of a newspaper called the Nauvoo Expositor. And essentially it charges Joseph Smith with all manner of crime, including polygamy. Joseph is outraged. And so he orders the printing press destroyed. Now, that seems bad enough, but this is pre-Abraham Lincoln. So the destruction of a printing press is antithetical to American values, and especially at that time. It's almost like an act of murder to go and destroy a press like that. It's an attack on freedom of speech. Sure. Now, I made the Lincoln jab because Lincoln's going to actually, during the Civil War, order anti-Lincoln <laughs> newspapers destroyed, things like that. So after that, the American conscience is a little bit numb to some of these things. Like we would still balk at it today, but I don't think it would have quite the same horror that it did here in the 1840s. 
We hear of like some news outlet being shuttered and we don't really feel bad about it. You know, we might, one <laughs> side might, one side might feel bad. The other side might cheer, you know, but the the principle of the thing is, is not so horrific to us. Right. So this action leads to Joseph Smith's arrest and he's going to be taken to Carthage jail. It's very significant. Joseph Smith had the chance to escape. Indeed, he starts to escape. He's going to be tried for for this, and this is a very serious crime. He has a chance to flee. He starts to leave, and then he turns back and heads back towards the jail. What causes him, when he could have got away scot-free, what causes him to go back? That's what I want to know. That's the That's the historian's cross, though, I suppose, because... <laughs> We can't know these things, but he can get away and he and he turns back. He's being held in the Carthage jail, which is about a half an hour away from Nauvoo, awaiting trial. While he's awaiting trial, a mob breaks in, kills Joseph and his brother. Now, there are two versions of the story. One has Joseph and Hiram dying basically quiet martyrs' deaths, the other has Joseph and his brother fighting back. There were firearms smuggled to them into the jail. So do they fight back? Do they not? That's what's kind of funny. I, w- I would certainly have more respect if they did fight back. <laughs> but Hiram is shot. Joseph is shot, actually falls out of the window of the jail. His last words are, while raising his hands, he cries out, my Lord and my God. They shoot him. He goes out the window, and that's the death of Joseph Smith. Now, we wonder, oh, Lord, my God, if that wasn't actually a signal to the Masons in the room. Masonry, very big in Nauvoo. Joseph Smith was a Mason. It could have been some kind of distress signal because if they had been good Masons, they would have been duty-bound by their oaths to stop assaulting him and to actually assist him. Or was it a cry for mercy to God in the face of death? That's 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 another question. I don't know if we can know. Yeah. That's the death of Joseph Smith in a small country jail, the leader of a city the size of Chicago, and one of the biggest and most significant religious religious movements in America dies at the hands of a lynch mob. How old was he at the time? Joseph was did he even reach 40? Was he 39? Let me think here. Well, that that's fine, but I mean, the point is is he wasn't all that old. Uh, 38. He's 38 years old. I just had to do some quick math there. 1805, 1844. Yeah. Yeah. So the fact that he's 38 and that in the past, I mean, it hasn't been all that many years. He's come from, you know, like you say, practically nothing, a a farm boy in New England to, like you say, dying as the the leader of, of this gigantic religious movement. I mean, it is a remarkable life, no matter how you look at it, whether you agree with him or not. You can't deny the fact that there is something unique about his story. Oh, absolutely. I mean, and you look at a guy like that who builds this giant movement, you know, and you're like, man, I got to I gotta really pick up the slack here. <laughs> Let's see. I'm how old and I have done what with my life? Yeah, I know. <laughs> it's a fascinating story, what happens, and it's really hard to do it justice. Amazing how it happens. I mean, even the death itself is kind of dramatic. I tend to believe that he did fight back. I mean, we have the guns that were used, the single shot pistol. Uh, That one might have disappeared, but we do have the actual pepper box that was smuggled into him. And there are eyewitnesses to it who give their testimony, all that. So we, we have a good idea of what happened. And he kind of goes, sort of goes out guns blazing, which is about as an American a story as I could think of. (laughs) <laughs> you know, there we are. And he dies, you know, right as the moment as the movement is starting to really get firm on its feet. He's laid down what's going to be some significant Mormon doctrines. You know, very recently, the polygamy revelations, which do come out after his death, but they are attributed to Joseph Smith. Not terribly long before his death, he preaches the Ken Follett discourse, which is where he first publicly acknowledges the Mormon concept of divinization whereby you might become your own God or the God of your own planet. You too can become a God, Mm -hmm. which we're going to unpack more when we talk about Brigham Young. So Mormonism is really starting to take its shape. The Nauvoo Temple has been built. 
The secret temple ordinances are happening. Baptism for the dead instituted. So in those few short years, you see this significant development. And so that's going to set the groundwork for the rest of Mormonism. So in the last few minutes, Zelwyn, what what should we make of Joseph Smith and his legacy in American history and American Christianity? Even if we're coming from a fairly critical standpoint, which, I mean, we are. I mean, we're not trying to say that we are, are coming in and saying that, you know, he was right about everything or like that. The fact that he is able to come in as he does and to so shape the course of American history in the way that Mormonism does, we cannot afford to ignore his story. We cannot afford to just brush him off and say, oh, he was just crazy. He looked, you know, what a loon he was, you know, and move on. We do have to seriously engage what it is that he does here. He is arguably the most significant American religious figure. I'd be hard pressed to, to disagree with you. You think of Mormonism today and the tremendous force that it has, even politically, despite its relatively small size within, you know, compared to other groups, especially, you know, even worldwide. And the fact that they are building Mormon temples all over the world now, and the fact that they have, you know, the kind of money that they have and the political influence that they have, this is the beginning of a movement which will, for better or worse, shape the American story. So we have to pay attention to it. Absolutely. Well, I can't top that. <laughs> it's been fun. <laughs> so join us, you know, a few episodes down the road. We might, we're going to be talking about the succession crisis. You know, who, who can succeed? The prophet Joseph Smith. That's an interesting part of history. We'll get more talks about militias. We're going to see some, you know, frontier wars and frontier justice. It's, a, it's basically cowboy times from here on out. So that's pretty fun. <laughs> well, this has been a Word Fitly Spoken. If you like what you heard and want to know more, check us out, wordfitlyspoken.org, facebook.com slash wordfitly, or Twitter at wordfitly. I'm Willie Grills, here with Zelwyn Heidi. God love you, and God bless. Once in the world's history, we were to have a Yankee prophet, and we have had him in Joe Smith. For good or for evil, he has left his track on the great pathway of life, or, to use words of horn, knocked out for himself a window in the wall of the 19th century, whence his rude, bold, good-humored face will peer out upon the generations to come. John Whittier <laughs>